Yes, uh, good day, board and, and staff and, and guests. Thank you for joining this work session. And, um, we're going to have an opportunity to go through some of our uh, two main facility projects today. We only have some conversation around them. Before we start that and before we, we get our lunch, I would like to have Ms. Janice Hernandez to lead us in our invocation. on our doorstep, and we want to make sure we share that information in case you do get phone calls about what does it mean to be a Alamo Farmers High School. And so in San Antonio, there are 25 inaugural high schools that will belong to Alamo Farmers, and this basically is, uh, to put it in a nutshell, it is free college uh, for all of our graduates through their associate's degree, and there's a lot more to it, but that's my most simple definition. So I'll turn it over to the lead, Aragon, our executive director for secondary curriculum, uh, and she will tell us a bit more about it. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, when Luis is passing out, you did receive a copy of the board background, but we did receive some updated information yesterday, so we wanted to provide you the latest numbers on our uh, data for Alamo Promise. So that is what Luis is uh, passing out. We did add about four more slides and have the data for each high school. So um, with the permission of the board and Dr. Burson, if um, I'm going to highlight, because we only I want to stay true to the allotted time, I'm going to highlight uh, some of the important information on the slides, but I really want to get to the data part uh, in case you have any questions. So Alamo Promise uh, is a commitment to funding. It will provide up to three years of funding for an associate, whichever comes first, for a student. And there is some criteria that they have to meet in order for that funding, uh, for them to earn new funding. So what it does is it does fill in the gap for financial aid. For example, it's going to vary per student. So if a student is eligible for a financial aid award of $8,000, but their bill for Alamo College is $10,000, then Alamo Promise will come in and cover the $2,000 if they meet certain criteria. There is some steps that they need to take to ensure that they will uh, be eligible for Alamo Promise, and that's what we'll be talking about in the next couple of slides. So phase one, there are a couple of phases for Alamo Promise rollout, and the first one is for 25 high schools, and both Southwest Legacy and Southwest High School are included in the first round for phase one. And again, it is projected to increase up to $230, uh, $230 million for students who are getting education or getting their two year or up to three years <coughs> education. Um, the guidelines for Alamo College is that they have to be a senior in one of the 25 colleges. They do have to be a Bear County resident, and they have to follow uh, some steps in order for them to be eligible, which we'll uh, see in the next slides. Now, one of the questions I had is, what about our students who are not Bear County residents? What does that mean for them? So we've asked uh, the uh, Alamo districts. What they've said is that they will fund our Bear County residents or students who do uh, fulfill the requirements for Alamo Promise. Then at the end, they will look at whatever funding is left over and that will go to uh, non-Bear County residents. Okay. So at the Alamo uh, 
with kickoff pep rallies at Southwest High School and Southwest Legacy High School. Part of the agenda included students would go ahead and scan the QR code and would fill out their save your seat. That is step one for Alamo Promise in order for them to be eligible for the funding. So we had both high schools participate in uh, Save Your Seat. Um, in addition, they need to uh, finish their Fly Texas and then also their FAFSA and TASCA, just depending on what they're eligible for. But this is where the data of uh, Southwest High School and Southwest Legacy, so you can look at what we're at. Our goal as a district is to be at 100% for Save Your Seat. And uh, right now we have 100 seniors right now at South Southwest High School that are still pending completion. So they are being pulled throughout the day to make sure that they get their Save Your Seat uh, completed. We do have a deadline of November 20th. That is our deadline to be at 100%. Um, so you can see where the 76.5 has been completed and we're still targeting the 23.5. For Southwest Legacy, it does look a little different because this data was pulled. It's not a database that we can instantly get results, real-time data. It's pulled from uh, Alamo Colleges, so there is some lag time in terms of students completed in between the time the data was pulled. So Southwest Legacy had their kickoff the last week of October, and we did have some uh, uh, difficulties with the wireless connection there. Uh, so that's why you see that they still have 181 seniors still pending, but today they're having a marathon of pulling in students who may not have been able uh, to access Save Your Seat because of uh, connectivity issues. So today they are all day at Southwest Legacy High School to make sure that that happens. And again, this is what the data looks like. We're still pending uh, about half of the senior class. Is that going to keep another student from another high school from getting in and, and then our kids decide they don't want to go? Or is everybody mm -hmm. just going to be able to save their seat? Uh, we would like for 100% to save your seat because we know that uh, if they don't do it by the uh, deadline, they won't be eligible. And plans do change. Seniors' plans do change. They may be interested in military. Uh, and then at the end, they said, you know what, I'm going to go to that two-year college. So to ensure that they do get the funding, uh, so we're asking them to do Save Your Seat as a backup plan. Right, no, I know, but then the, okay. the community colleges are, are, are preparing to receive more than 7,000 to 14,000 additional students. What they, what they have been able to witness at Dallas Promise, who they've been into this program already a few years, uh, is that you see a small a increase of the first year, and then you see a large increase mm -hmm. in year three. Mm -hmm. This is more of a ceremonial save your seat, has meant to do with their application to okay. ACCD, uh, but it's kind of a, we're encouraging all of our students, even if they are already accepted to UT of A&M or, or to Rice or you know, out of state, mm -hmm. uh, that in the event something happens, they already are in the system and they save their seat, uh, but it's not going to mean they have to go there or, or no, no, that, that, yeah, no, my question is more along the lines, is there a limit of seats available? Like if we have everybody signing up at Southwest, and then say, the call of it's kind of slow at signing people yeah, up. They're not going to turn anybody okay. else away. Okay. They're actually doing this, and it's going to help their recruitment, mm -hmm. right. so they can build their program. Okay. So they're right. Where's the here. money coming from? It, it's a mix of both public and uh, private funding. Some are institutions, some are private donors that have uh, donated. Some are coming from the Alamo Colleges District as well. The city, the county, philanthropy, uh, and the business sector. But now, also financially. The county is paying part of that. They got to pick up these other kids that are there. Everyone in Bear County qualifies outside of Bear County and the non qualifiers. Okay. So when you say all costs, it's a pretty broad statement. Uh, you talk about tuition, books, yes, uh, fees. It's a last dollar scholarship, which means the students have to complete the application, <coughs> their FAFSA, and whatever FAFSA doesn't uh, cover, the ACCD is going to cover towards completion of their associates or workforce certificate. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And the cohort number, where, where <coughs> that 426 for Southwest, who are those? I mean, we have more seniors than that graduating. So that 400, what 
Well, who's comprised? Who comprises that number? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we have a, actually a smaller senior class this year. Oh, that's right, because we're two. Yes. You're right. Okay. That's okay. a 426 plus a 350. But even adding those yeah. together, it's still smaller. When, uh, but it is technically supposed to be all of our seniors then. Okay. Yes. Okay. Forgot about that. That's a good question. Uh, so these are the data request days that uh, we have asked for Alamo colleges to send us back the data. So we are monitoring to see where we're at with our goal to ensure that we do reach the 100%. Um, and this will also be part of what we'll be bringing at a later time. But uh, we will be having a large group of district staff also meeting with our seniors. And part of the conversation is going to be uh, also save your seat. Have you completed save your seat? So that's Alamo Promise, and, and thank you, Zelene, uh, for the break, <coughs> what it is. That's been a two-year planning um, that we're coming to San Antonio, and, and so it's going to be a great thing for a, a lot of our kids. And uh, we also plan to add on cast in as they uh, create a, a senior class in two years. They'll be part of the program as well. Um, and so um, we're even having conversations around uh, how does this affect policy, is you know we encourage students to do the FAFSA, but now that we know that it puts them in the system, and if they decide to go either first year out or second or third year out, they'll have all of the information in the system. So thank you for the information. And I forgot to allow everyone to get lunch before we move back into this. I apologize, Mr. President. Uh, before we get to item B, I would like to suggest we get lunch. <laughs> So again, welcome to this work session meeting. And so we wanted to dedicate uh, a good amount of time to really kind of get into our projects and uh, using one of those words. So from this state-of-the-art room, we're going to talk about state-of-the-art uh, opportunities in our district for our kids. Uh, one of them being uh, phase three of our Southwest High School, and I believe the other one being our, our natatorium that's in design phase. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Chris. Uh, he works uh, diligently with his his group and his department in facility maintenance and uh, new construction, and then we're going to take each project, I believe, and kind of break it down and have a conversation. So today, first of all, I want to uh, take this time to introduce Mr. Bullikas. If you could stand up, sir. This is uh, Billy Bullikas, and he's filling uh, our team. Uh, for the first time in a long time, we have a fully staffed construction team, and so we're pretty excited about bringing him on. He'll be helping us at the, at the perfect time with all these projects coming up. Uh, huh? So today is really the uh, kind of jump in the weeds with you guys, show you everything that we've been working on, uh, getting kind of some, some oversight of everything that's been going on since uh, bringing on the architects and with, uh, with one project, our contractor, uh, and, and allow you to ask questions and um, feel free to stop us as we're going through. So I'm going to turn it over to Raphael, uh, he kind of get everything started. And then we're going to start with, uh, obviously, phase three of Southwest High School, and then go from there. If you have yes, questions so. at any time, mm -hmm. don't hesitate. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our team. Uh, Ms. Kai Hopkins, uh, Andrew Pettis with Fluor, and Mr. Lawrence Garcia with KingCon. They're going to get, be pretty much giving us an uh, overview of where we're standing in the project in terms of uh, design and also budget numbers. Uh, so now that we have KenCon as our uh, CM at risk, they're uh, aiding us in the process of uh, budgeting for the project. We have had several meetings with uh, campus uh, administrators just to kind of give them an option and give them really uh, uh, a review of the project and where we stand um, for the renovation and other projects or other elements that will become at alternates. But uh, I'll let uh, Andrew and Kai go over the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, uh, I'm Andrew Ben with Food Architects. And, and I'm Kai Hopkins. Thank you. And thank you, Raphael, for the introduction. So, uh, we did present to you all uh, at the, uh, the last board meeting where we were at on phase three. And I'm happy to say that we've made some additional progress since then. So, we do have an update for you in addition to wanting to answer any questions you may have had from that previous meeting and anything that comes up today. Um, so, we are pleased to have Lawrence Garcia from Pentacon with us as well. They're the CMA risk for this project. So, uh, we brought him along to also answer any questions. That they may spring up. Uh, with that said, we'll go ahead and get into the 
All right, so you may recall during our last meeting that we identified priority one scope as the infrastructure, which is MVP upgrades on the campus, uh, mainly replacement of rooftop units, electrical panels, there's a gas line that needs to be replaced. Uh, all of those items are very critical, but are kind of behind the scenes. So that takes up the bulk of what we're doing in priority one work. In addition, we're looking at classroom upgrades, which we do have some updates for you uh, on. And then lastly, renovating all of the group restrooms in the, in the 1982 campus property. Uh, since we met last time, we actually spent some time last Friday with Mr. Black, the principal over at Southwest High School, as well as Mr. Flores, the Fine Arts Director, to get a little bit more information about what we really need to hone in on on Priority 2. And I'll have Kai talk to that a little bit. But we've identified this as, as what we carried as project alternates for this project as the ROTC and life skills suite, uh, building out the fire hall, which you are familiar with, uh, art room renovations, cyber patron renovations, and then lastly, uh, store front hardware replacement, and then the regroup of the existing CTE building. So with that, I'll get into priority one. Um, again, uh, there's definitely familiarity with that, but what has changed since then is that we were able to identify what actually needs to be done in the classrooms that we're renovating. Because we were approaching this originally as being a complete uh, reset of all finishes, uh, building a brand new furred out teaching wall in every room with brand new display boards, ceilings, light fixtures, you name it. What we've since identified is there are rooms that don't require as much renovation, and so we've been able to pinpoint those rooms, which ultimately led to a very quick cost reduction on Kencom's behalf. So, the original data that was presented to you actually had this number at $15.1 million, and you can see that's actually come down now to 14.575 against our budget of 14.5. So we're starting to track in the right direction. We're very pleased uh, in working with KenCon to be able to present that to you. And uh, with that said, the uh, MEP infrastructure and the rest of the foundations uh, remain the same until we can get some additional pricing information as we develop drawings further, but we did want to share this with you. So what you're seeing here, and it, that's included in the handouts, um, is the actual breakdown of what is going to be cut in priority one, with the darkest areas being the most heavy renovation of classroom spaces. And then we've identified some rooms on the first floor here that actually don't require as much renovation, but will still need new ceilings and light fixtures and display boards. So that lighter green color represents a little bit less work. And even further still, on the second floor in the southwest corner of the building, the rooms that were actually renovated, as we understand it, in 2002, received brand new flooring, new ceilings, new light fixtures at the time. So in those rooms, we would actually only need to replace the lights with LED lights and maybe touch up the paint in there. Uh, so that's actually very, very uh, exciting to discover that there are rooms that are in better shape, so to speak. And so with that, we end up with a cost savings. One other item I want to mention is we have the restrooms shown in blue. Each of these restrooms are going to receive the same work. So you'll recall, and we have a little graphic, that in phase two, we renovated restrooms on the first floor, which are located right here along the Vernon Heel Suite. And we would propose to do the exact same renovations in all of the other restrooms, with the exception of one in that southwest corner, which again is actually in better shape and does just require a very basic refresh. So we'll put some new light fixtures, new toilet accessories, and we'll try to repair some of the, the very minimally damaged tile in that room. One other thing, go ahead, Pat. Yeah, I was just going to say to orient you, you do have the handout yes. of this presentation um, and to get an idea of where we are in all of these spaces. This is the first floor, this is the second floor, and this arrow here is the entrance to the building. So that way you can get a little bit of a feel of what spaces we're looking at. Another thing to note is this yes. eight and a half by 11 sheet does have the um, regular classrooms and the restrooms listed on here that correspond with the color coding on this plan. That way you can see generally what the scope is going to be for those renovations and that'll get you a little bit more oriented on, on the detail of each space. Thanks, Pat. So um, we did break that down into basically three levels. So there's not necessarily a different scope on an individual room by room basis. It's really color coded to be very simple and explain that these dark green rooms receive the most work, the middle green receives a little bit less work, and then lastly, the very light green receives the least work just to refresh the space. One other item we did want to mention, uh, there was a question that came up during the last board meeting that was handed back to us by the facilities folks. 
We are now going to include the uh, group restroom suite in the admin area uh, in the renovation scope as well. So I did want to make sure to point that out and acknowledge that we did get that question. So we are we are incorporating that. So this is just a refresh for, for what we showed you at the last board meeting, but this would be what we would do in the, the classrooms that receive the most work. So we would replace the ceiling and light fixtures, replace the flooring. If we have existing glazed CMU block, we will not be messing with that because we understand it's very touch and go. We don't want to damage it or create any concerns you know, with, with renovating that space. But we would fur out the teaching wall with a new high impact gypsum wall board painted with a sliding marker board, which was actually introduced in the heel in phase two, and we would provide a new built-in teacher cabinet. And so the difference between this and the rest of the scope is that rooms that we've identified as medium priority wouldn't get the teaching wall, but would receive new marker boards and so on and so forth. We also have the slide that we showed at the last board meeting that shows what we did in phase two with the restrooms to give you a little bit of a flavor for what we would do with the rest of the restrooms in there. So as you can see, Taking the existing restrooms, we did go back in with brand new finishes. We have that large format porcelain tile that's on the walls, brand new toilet accessories, mirrors, etc. So this would actually go for all of the restrooms with the exception of the two that I had mentioned in the upper southwest corner. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kai to talk a little bit more about what we've identified as priority. So, yes. Yes, sir. I just want so everyone understands. So rooms 23 through 30, we're not getting the full board or the teacher's cabinet. Is that a certain section like public or? Like, those are those are actually not being used as traditional classroom spaces right now, so that's why we had to really revisit those as offices or or smaller. Those are, yes, support spaces. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. either additional offices. Uh, I know Light Skills has a second area uh, for some of their student overflow, uh, but they don't require or really need that full-on renovation. But that portion of the CPE building is more of a support space and not an actual classroom. Right, and they are considered the smaller size yes. than yeah, the other classrooms. Mm. So in the future, it's not as if you can fit 35 students into a room that size anyway. So we're just looking at um, what is what we need right now and where we can, I guess, make the most of it. They would, they would still receive the new ceilings, new lights, flooring, and not the wall, right? right. The fur out. Right. Right. Yeah. And it does include visual display boards as well. So that's just a, a, a regular um, marker board. So the rooms that we were working with, the very end, are those included in no, no. the decoration of the So those are actually not included. Uh, before we presented the last, at the last board meeting, that was actually determined to be something that we would remove because it wasn't a high priority work area, and we did have concerns with being over budget. Uh, so those did kind of fall off a little bit earlier on in design. I just want the board to understand sure, that, yes. that there's, there's some decisions to get this within the budget already being made, like the food the case, if you don't have a lot of activity going on there these back rooms that are more office-like mm -hmm. rather than uh, a student-teacher engagement environment. And so, um, so that you know this is not touching every room. It's touching every room, not to the same level, of course, for people yes. in the area that are not the same level. Are you saying the cave? Cave? Okay. It's referred to informally as the cave area. Well, please, I think all that's true. That started in the 80s, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so currently, I know, she graduated when she started when she was a student. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been when she was So those are currently being used as some test days. Uh, and they, uh, we, we, we did the hallway and the corridor, so it looks nice. And they're not bad classrooms, but they're not being used on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's how much of a savings? A million? I remember uh, it was pretty substantial. It's 12 classrooms. We can track it. We can kind of give you a budget number on how much that is. Um, again, to reiterate, our point was to have priority one within budget. Right. right. So everything that we can fit, and whether we like it or not, the infrastructure takes the most of it. So uh, these are items that are, like Mr. Chris was saying, they're not used to standard classrooms. They're used once, twice maybe three times a year on testing days. So the efforts and the mm -hmm. resources are better used somewhere else where we have two students on the daily or support spaces. Well, we can get you that number. 
So one last thing I did want to bring up before I give it to Kai. Uh, we do have original talks data that was provided for priority two. So as you may recall in the last board meeting, we did acknowledge that this is above and beyond the, the budget for priority one. So since then, after having conversations with the campus and the fine arts director, we are taking the information that we got from KenCon and we're absorbing that into what we're identifying as four renovation alternates and then the other two alternates for the entrance door hardware replacement and regroup. We are not updating that number just yet because we do need to get this information back to KenCon for repricing. So this number here is actually subject to either decrease or increase, hopefully decrease, but we didn't want to be forthcoming with that. So for the the air So for the priority two areas, the alternate areas, we have the non-traditional classroom spaces. So this is the first floor, as you'll see. Here's your entrance again. So we can first talk about the ROTC and the life skills area. So we did walk those spaces just to see the um, condition currently on those. And we did talk to the staff about what the needs were in those spaces and how we could, we could improve them. So there's going to be very specific needs there that don't really fall under a standard classroom um, requirement. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the areas that we would treat very uh, specialized, in a very specialized way for the ROTC and the life skills. And that can be um, looked into more as we, uh, as we proceed. And we have talked about and presented on the choir area over here in that uh, 2002 edition um, and creating a choir area out of these two classrooms right here. And so breaking that wall down and creating a larger space to have a new choir hall. Um, so that is the core of the priority two school. And then the second core is on the second is on the next page. And that includes the art area. And so that's in here. We have the kiln room, we have a couple of art classrooms in here currently, and getting all of the art classrooms in the same area would be the goal. Mm -hmm. I understand that there are a couple here and then we have some more in another mm -hmm. area. And so bringing everybody up here to be able to make the most of the resources and um, give a full refresh of those spaces so that they're more usable and the uh, science uh, lab infrastructure that's currently there Updating that to be more appropriate for art studios would be part of that scope. And then up here, again, we're on the second floor. Up here is the cyber patient area. So there's two classrooms next to each other, and the scope of that would um, be worked out, but it would include maybe connecting those spaces in some sort of way and making um, really flexible um, connections for all of the computer work that they do and the maintenance that they do on the machines and all of those things. I know that they have to move things around a lot. There's a lot of machines, there's a lot of uh, collaboration that happens. So making those more appropriate for that type of space as well. And that's the other um, non-traditional priority to classroom areas. I have a question. Um, so <clears throat> is it possible to set up a day where we can go see this as is, right? Absolutely. And but that y'all would be there and kind of show us this is what we're thinking, or this is what yeah. the teachers have asked for, and, uh, so Certainly. we have a better idea. Because I don't know that I well, I know I've never been to that cave area, <laughs> <laughs> not from West Campus. Ask Yolanda. Yeah, I don't think I've even soon. ever been to the ROTC. <laughs> except when we redid it, I think. Can we do something here? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, so I kind of like to see what it is now, and then your vision that way yeah. we can. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So we'll coordinate that. We'll coordinate with everybody. Else. So yeah, we, like, we actually have one of the better ROTC I think areas. Mm -hmm. There may be some upgrades, but I don't think it's going to be major. Right? So I well, think we also need to have a conversation about what we're doing on ROTC facilities at Legacy High School, mm -hmm. as they don't have one. Oh. Um, and so. Uh, <laughs> You know, I think yes. we have to be really talking to them about that as well, about what yeah. we do there. Um, maybe through some uh, fun dogs, opportunities, we have to talk about that. I think that's kind of a summer thing we're looking at. I have a question. Um, 
is that something that maybe we just don't even touch this one and just put all the money over there? Well, I think it's I think it's a great idea. I think we walk it and we look at it. And I think it'd be very positive to see. But I think we can also say we're always trying to update our facility to make sure our kids have a state of the art education uh, right. experiences. There may be some things there. I just don't think it's going to be major. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Since it did come in with the expansion uh, of the fine art uh, section of that building, uh, that's where you did the rotation. And a great walk if I may, I'm sorry, yeah, I just wanted to throw one thing out. So if I may add to that, these items are actually being tracked as what we call ad alternates. And so what we're going to do is we'll propose the scope and get a price for it. Mm -hmm. And you can certainly decide that you don't want to spend money on that particular scope. Mm -hmm. And each quadrant that we've identified is its own alternate. So we can literally pick our ROTC out and say, you know what, Maybe we, we see it, we like it, but we don't need it right now. So we will go ahead and take that out. So you definitely have the option. So I think it might be a good idea if you give us a nice uh, cost estimate of if we do add our OTP to legacy. <coughs> so then maybe if we know that's going to cost us a sure. million dollars or two million, whatever, then we may say, uh, no. sure. you know what I mean? Because we're not going to be taking on a fund balance for every extra thing we want to do. And right? That's a great idea. I was say we have a short term uh, plan we want to bring to the board, okay. and then we have a longer term that in that includes uh, expanding Southwest Legacy. We know that we can find out rooftops in the next four to five years there. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that, I think we're going to have capacity there but a lot quicker to get at Southwest High School. Okay. So, yeah. And that segues um, to my question, and it's a little bit bigger picture. I'm wondering um, the number of students that we could house at Southwest <coughs> before the um, all these renovations. Is that number still the same, or did we take away from that capacity to remodel and add all these things? It's still the same. It's still the same? My, uh, Comfortably. Yeah. The only thing we reduced any of the, the health area. The health area is where we lost a couple of classrooms. But right, that, that was my concern. But we have, like, like, right, they said, like the whole cave right now is not being occupied for for classrooms. So right. there's twelve classrooms there. That back hallway, uh, where they have like smaller classrooms, though, used to be used when we were bigger. Uh, Ooh, we're more full. Well, yeah, but those. So we have capacity to add. So what is our number? What is our number for a comfortable capacity at that school right now? Hmm. If I had to guess, I would say it's around twenty six hundred. And, and how many do we have? What are, what are about 2,000. Okay, so we have room for growth about 600. Okay. I, I think comfortable. Comfortable. I'm saying comfortable. Because I think I was, what was the highest number? 32? Okay. That's when we have the bugs that are. We're right at three. Yeah. I, 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 I would think that's our four dollars. Max. Okay. Thank you. So lastly, we just have a, a quick summation of the, the cost estimates for priority one and two. So again, priority one did see a good reduction, um, and we're hoping that this will get further tailored the, the further we develop the plan along with Pentagon looking at the pricing exercise. We will be coming back to you with, with updated numbers for priority two down, now that we've identified areas of significance. Um, this number is totaled right now, but we will give you individual numbers again. So those are something you can very easily decide. You know, I'd like to do one, two, and four, but not number three. So we want to give you the opportunity to do that because we do recognize that that is, again, above and beyond your budget for the priority one work. And with that said, I know we, we, uh, we left the slide to write down any questions you may have, and that's if you have questions for facilities to pass on to us. But in the meantime, we're happy to answer any questions you have uh, at the moment. No. Fourteen five is the construction budget. Yes. So, so you know, we have about we have fourteen five. So our goal is to get priority one is what we kind of focus is as a priority for this project. And so we want to get within budget for that. Uh, similar to other projects we've had, uh, we have other things that have been added to the list with other stakeholders, with other people that we feel that like could be in this project. But we also have a limited budget. Uh, so we're going to get pricing and see where we land. And at the end of the day. We have a project, we have a bond budget, and if that's what we want to do, we want to, that's what we will do. Uh, if we feel like there's certain things on there that we may need to make a recommendation to you all, or that we feel like as a, as a group that need to be added, we will do that. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that we also have three other priority projects from the bond that you're going to, like one of them you're going to mm -hmm. see today. Uh, so you'll have to also prioritize, you're going to, with fund balances, 
if we have because we may have four projects and we don't want to bring every project all this money to add. Yeah. So we're going to have to, we, as you get those numbers, as you see fund balance, I'm going to be bringing our updated fund balance at the next board meeting so you can see where we added money this year to fund balance. So you see that overall number before we start making decisions. This is all preliminary. We're going through the, the but at the end of the day, when we bring a GMP, we're going to give you a budget that's within budget with bonds mm -hmm. and with these extras that if we can do it, we would. Uh, that, that's kind of my concern, the fund balance thing. Is, I mean, we, so this would be like just a 44 million, four and a half million dollars. Correct. Just for this. But Correct. then, like you said, we also have these other things. So uh, probably I need a running total. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, what you're going to request, like as of today, if, you, if we did everything you wanted us to do, what is that total? <coughs> right. Correct. And so, but we also didn't want to take things out without y'all no, knowing I, about I, it. I, I so we have a list, and then we would we're going to get within budget and mm -hmm. tell you this is the other things that are possibly being, being left out because of our budget. Right. And then we can go from there. Yeah. But I will give you updated fund balance with all our other projects that we're kind of looking at mm -hmm. what that may cost us. Yeah. Uh, so the, we can all make the decisions right. together. And they can also, how much fund balance we're willing to spend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And also that priority two list, if you guys could put that in order, dependent on, like, you know, some areas I'm sure are <coughs> much easier than others. Sure. So if we could prioritize those um, with the ones that are mo affecting the most kids detrimentally at the top. Okay. So that then we, we also it. have a clear idea of what's, what needs the most attention first. So okay. why would we get this from, from the board? When would be a good time to schedule a site visit to have our architect and our staff uh, to walk with a Tuesday work for, for you guys? Yeah. Uh, like next Tuesday? And if we meet on the it's kind of gonna, mm -hmm. we kind of need to move pretty quick on it if mm -hmm. we want to go and look, but we can. Because we like to keep moving forward. Yeah. Like, uh, we already uh, have a, a meeting Tuesday night, right? Yeah. yeah. That, that'll work for me all day. We don't have to bring that to the back. Oh, we have a table. We have a public hearing at 5.30. Yeah. Oh, 4.30. Train. We have 20. Oh. That's Tuesday. Tuesday. It would have to be like after 12. After 12 would be good. Can we do it like earlier? Yeah, we did. We did. We're good. 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 we are yeah, oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I'll tell you. 4.30 next Tuesday? No, I can't. We'll, we'll discuss it. Probably 4.45 because the school's letting out. So we we'll negotiate for an hour before our board meeting on Tuesday? To meet locally? I think that works great. Yeah. We can even, if y'all want to come to the board room, we can take a yeah. little activity bus and go over there. And, yeah. Uh, the <laughs> Any more questions for Porter and Andrew? No, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. All right. I was thinking the board meeting. I was looking down the road. It's not the next one. So we're going to transition into our other uh, project that's uh, ongoing now. And, uh, with us, we have Mommy Mott. So I'll let Rafael introduce everybody. We have Mr. Greg Houston and uh, I will share that you have this handout in front of you. Uh, and this is our first one, so this is pretty detailed. You may, if you can't really see it up there, uh, they gave it a straight handout. All right, Greg, Sean. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Greg Houston. Our company is Martin Mop. And um, with me today, is we specialize in this type of work, and this is our first time to present to you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, we're going to go through the handout, uh, and as Randy said, if you can't see it up here, you can refer to the handout. Um, and we're going to look at different uh, components of the management process. And there are some options that we're looking at because we're in the program phase. And in the program phase, we're really trying to define what all will be in the project. 
So we're bringing you a program that's within your budget, but we're also bringing you some options to look at that might enhance the project if funds are available. Okay? <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, what we want to go through first are, like Greg said, are some of the components. In the programming process, what we've done is try to really analyze, number one, what is the community looking for, the school district and the community as a whole. And secondly, what are the components that need to satisfy those requirements? And then with our expertise, doing these uh, facilities, these type of facilities, what can we do to help engage that? <coughs> provide additional information that may be, or program space that may be necessary. So what, we want, what we've discovered is based on all of the programming discussions is, number one, competitive pool. Then number two, how do we serve other constituents in the community? And that is a, a secondary pool. Why two pools? Because you limit the programming ability in a single pool. Okay. So that's why right now we're looking at a two-pool system, competitive and dive, competitive swim and dive, along with a warm-up instructional. Warm-up instructional, more for the community side, and then on the, of course, for the competitive side, we have to swim and dive. But also additional programming space, because depending on the size of pool. But then we get up to, we're talking about, okay, when we have events or people coming gathering, how large a uh, spectator seating should we provide? So right now, this size facility, when we look at two different types of pools, and I'll get into this a little bit more, I'll be referring a lot to about a 25-meter stretch and a 50-meter pool. Two different size competitive swim pools of the guy. But based on those two sizes, how much seating is appropriate for that type of venue? So 750 It's about the average what we would expect depending on the regional or uh, size uh, event that you host. And then, of course, we have the more uh, uh, traditional user spaces, like the, uh, the athletic lockers and the public lockers, uh, which would then, at this point, have uh, consider your, your toilets, your showers, and how they're used. Right now, what we're looking at in the program, what we've identified in the use and for uh, good uh, uh, measures for uh, liabilities, uh, risk management, the public side, and the student and athlete side would actually be separated among the locker rooms. So you would have a public locker room and a, a, a separate student-athlete locker room. Now, they would still share uh, common bathrooms and common showers. So that's another uh, portion of the, of the uh, programming that we've discovered that is, is, is desired and, and really works with how the facility wants to be used and how it wants to be managed. And then we talk about uh, office suites or office space. Typically, you have just an aquatics office uh, space. Here, athletics would like to be able to house here as well and have every all of the athletics in which aquatics is a part of athletic, have it all housed in one location. So then that means an office suite. <clears throat> then we talk about the what we call multi-purpose spaces. And these more of the multi-purpose flex spaces, such as meet rooms, wet classrooms, and strength training, um, all of these components uh, can be rooms that are flexible in nature. Not only can they be used as their title, but then they could be, what if you want to lease them, rent them, or, or use them in a different uh, uh, way for the community. The community could have events here or host meetings here. So that those rooms become flexible. Uh, strength training, another big component about student athlete and training there. So that's another co uh, component that we 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 would like to recommend and is desired by by the uh, uh, athletics department and, and aquatics department. Um, <clears throat> then we get into the support spaces uh, like first aid, lifeguard. Not as flexible, but we do recommend having a separate lifeguard. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, aquatic coach's office. Now, when I talk about that separate from the suite, that's because the suite is really a little more removed from the pool deck itself. The space is first aid, lifeguard, aquatics office. These are where your lifeguards are in your aquatics office that are on deck watching your pool. Good risk management. What type of pool activities? Well, depends on the size. 
but we'll go in. Uh, obviously, swim and dive, water polo. Tri when I start talking about size, this is where a triathlete becomes an issue. A triathlete typically runs off 50 meters. Mm -hmm. okay. How many? How many people have uh, have swam or club swam competitively swam? Have no students that do. I hear a lot. I hear a lot of people that are probably understand a lot of that. I want to make sure I can. <laughs> well, and then there's synchronized swimming. The reason I ask that because I want to make sure I'm going into enough detail so it makes sense what I'm saying. I tend to think everybody knows what I'm talking about. So, uh, uh, community swim a big component. But then again, how do you want to treat that component? Is that component a part of your uh, competitive swim pool where you want, typically want deeper water? Well, well, learn to swim in community swim may not want deep water. So that's why, hence the idea of the second pool. Uh, learn to swim, obvious what it is. Difference between learn to swim in a competitive pool versus a therapeutic or a warm up, water temperature, 82 degrees for competitive, you get into uh, high 80s even 90s for your uh, therapy pool. Big difference, your first time swimmers don't want to come out with blue lips. You want them to come back. Mm -hmm. It's a big difference. Temperature, so it makes sense to want to cater to that. Uh, fitness and aerobics, therapeutic rehabilitation, lifeguard instruction, and life safety skills. All of these components can be done out of either pool, but then you've got to talk about depth, and you've got to talk about programming availability. Again, hence the reason for two pools. And that's what we've got programmed. So what do these two pools look like? Well, I mentioned earlier this 50 meter, and I mentioned the 25 meter stretch. The 50 meter, make sure I point this correctly, is the entire length here. That includes long course uh, race, uh, uh, swim, USA, a triathlete and such. It is not your typical U, uh, 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 Federation of High School uh, Association, uh, which is typically short course. This is considered a long course. And I'll show you some variations to how this pool can be configured. Then the second pool is your warm up and your shallower water. So when I talk about shallower water, this is your, your three and a half to four foot deep water. Your competitive pool, which will have a dive component, dive component portion about 13 and a half feet, and then your competitive swim lanes, a portion of that is in your 13 and a half, is, is six and a half feet, seven and a half feet, typical depth. You're not going to want to put first time learners or swim up in there. Uh, it's perfect for water, uh, water polo, uh, synchronized swim, and all the other associated but you're, you're, you want the deeper water for your competitive swim. Yes, ma'am. So you said uh, this is uh, a 50 pool, then we need for our high school competition? I, I have not said it's not uh, too big for you. It is typically, you would use high school, does uh, run on a 25 yard course. And, and if I can, I, I, will, I will be able to address that a little bit better here okay, in just a second. Sure. That's a very good question, because you're leading, I'm, you're leading me down where I'm going to go. Okay. So, uh, so then we get to the 25 meter stretch. 25 meter is just this portion, then the stretch is the remainder. So from here to here is what we call the 25 yard, or 25 meter stretch. Mm -hmm. You would have your dive component, and then you would have your competitive lanes. These lanes, all the way to this point, are not long enough for long uh, for uh, long course swim. But what it does, you know, and I'll get into it, this is going to answer a lot of questions for you when I get into the next couple of slides. But what it what it does is allows you to do 25 yard, 25 meter competitive and dive at the same time. If I go back to the 50 meter, I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead. I can do a 25 yard or 25 meter and another 25 yard, 25 meter event. You can have two courses running at one time for high school level. That's where it becomes a little more helpful as you prepare for 
more and more students getting into the program. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll have some more diagrams down the road that are going to show you that. So what are the benefits between a 50 meter of for a 50 meter? Well, you get eight lanes of a 50 meter course. That's the long course, the length of the pool. You have eight lanes of 25 or 25 meter, a 25 yard or 25 meter course, but you get two sets of eight lanes. So you can run one course and then it can be running another course simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Okay. But hold on to the simultaneously when we talk about competitive dive. Then it has 21 lanes of cross course. This is what we call cross course, and this is what we call competitive direction. <coughs> you have 21 lanes of that practice lanes. Then you, with this size pool, USA can come here, master swim, triathlon, triathlete, and then the National Federation of High School, that's where you guys will be using most of the time, 25 yard, 25 meter, but you can run two sets at a time. But you also have the ability to host these other events. <clears throat> then swim and dive. Now, while you run eight lanes of competitive swim on a 50 meter, you will not be able to run another set of eight lanes, but you can dive. So you can have competitive dive happening at the same time as you're running eight lanes of competitive swim. But you also have the ability to do warm-up lanes in this barge. And that is a benefit. The, play, the swimmers want warm-up lanes. Mm -hmm. So, and I'll show you again, I'll show you some diagrams. And then you have 16 lanes of cross course and practice while you dive as well. The difference here, as you see, I've, I've, I've gray toned out what the 50 meter has and showing a difference of what you don't get in a 25. 25 doesn't give you the eight lanes of 50 meter. It gives you eight lanes of 25 yard and 25 meter, but only eight lanes. You don't get in the second set. Um, you're, you're allowed to have sw uh, 14 swimmers that can compete at one time for cross course or 16, I think it's 14 lanes of uh, practice swim as well. Then you do not have the ability to have a host any kind of USA or Masters of Triathlon again, but you do have the National Federation. To swim and dive, again, you can get eight lanes in competitive swim and dive, but you have no warm up lanes. You have to go to a secondary pool to do that. And yes, you have that for both, both uh, configurations. And it, only, it allows 10 lanes of cross course, uh, cross course practice swim while you can dive at the same time. You don't get all 14 lanes at the same time if you dive. So now, all of this, now I've got these nice graphics for you so you can understand, uh, so it makes a little bit more visual sense. On the 50 meter, depending on, and bulk it's one thing I failed to mention, in, in these type of pools, in the competitive pool, you'll have what's called bulkhead. It's movable. Your head wall is typically at your land side, and you have a bulkhead. And in the 50 meter, you would have two. And you would, you can put those in several different configurations to allow for however you want this, this pool to function. In this case, we're assuming there's no dive for this event. But now I can run two sets of eight lanes of competitive swim. In the 25 meter stretch, I can only run eight. But you would have some practice lanes, warm up lanes. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't dive at this point. We're not talking diving, we're talking about events without dive. And then you will have those. Now let's talk about warm up. In a 50 meter, you'll have up to 20, or 21 lanes of warm up. Once those bulkheads I talked about, you saw one here and here. Once they're moved down out of the way, you have 21. You can actually put them back over here and do uh, 10 over here and 11 over here. Say you have the two different high schools are here at one time. One separated for any reason. Mm -hmm. Gives you options. 25, you only get 16. So then let's talk about competitive swim with dive. Now with 50 meter, you have the eight lanes. You can have some warm up and you can still run competitive dive. On, this, mm -hmm. on the 25-meter on the stretch, 
you have the eight lanes of competitive swim, and you can dive, but you have to resort to the warmer pool for warm up. And then during practice, you would have uh, 16 lanes of swim in the cross course direction, and you can still dive, practice dive. And then in stretch 25, you would have up to 10, and then have practice. So all of that makes sense? Um, so, okay. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of different things. I, I have a question, though, real quick. Um, so being that none of us really have, except for Flo, she has, she, her, her skin swam. Yeah, they swam competitively. But, um, <coughs> so really, I don't know what to No, that's fine. But uh, maybe if we, maybe Jerry Hernandez could tell us how the, when we to run, and then we would know, like, oh, I know we don't barely use that, or yeah, we, but, or we could go to a swim meet and see okay. the benefits of this bigger pool versus the smaller pool, because, I mean, really, it's kind of sad that we would decide what kind of pool we need, because we don't without, know what Without the exposure, need. right. So, a couple of things that probably need to be clarified. Uh, in a high school meet, you swim at 25 yards, not meters. Uh, secondly, if you go to SA, uh, ISD's Navatorium, go to Palo Alto, where we do most of our swim meets, they'll swim one, one 25 yard, because they're competitive, where the girls and the boys go through their heats and, and do that, and then they'll have, and they have a 50 meter, and then they'll have their warm up on the other side of the bulkhead. They'll have their warm up, and then just a kind of a lounging spot where they, get, they just kind of do their other warm up stuff, so they'll use that. And so if you're looking at, if you go back a slide, please, or where you had the, yeah. So the top one is is somewhat what you will see at a regular swim meet with 50 with 50 meters. You'll also see the same type of setup if you go to Corpus Christi when they swim the regional meet and everything. Um, the, so the, Palo Alto has <coughs> what we are talking about. The 50? Yeah, yes, they have, they have the 50, they have the 50 meters. Right. Who has the 25? So, Raphael and I took time a couple weeks ago to go to New Canaan uh, High School outside of Houston, which is about the only one we could find okay. within driving distance to go check it out. And a couple of things that we learned there, um, because we because the 25, as they'll get to, is part of the budget part and everything. And so we wanted to see first if, if we made sure that we could provide our kids with everything that we need to do these things. And we can. Um, when we talk to their athletic director, a couple of differences is they don't, um, it's, there's not a public part of that pool. It is solely for the ISD usage. They don't do swimming lessons like we would do. They don't do any of those things. It's straight competitive. They have two high schools just like we do at 5A. They're, they're getting ready to build a third one. Uh, one of the interesting things that he did say was when they build the third one, they're building a practice pool into that third high school and then coming back and building practice pools in the other three. They swim their JVs, I mean their varsities in the morning and their JVs in the afternoon. Um, currently, what we do is when we go to Palo Alto, it is, it is our two schools, South San as well as East Central and maybe a couple others, and I think Medina Valley's getting ready to, to do that too. And so when we build ours, I'm pretty sure that we would be, we could rent out lanes mm -hmm. as we go and, you know, recoup some of the cost mm -hmm. and everything to some of that. And so those 21 lanes, currently we pay a, a decent price to have a couple, two to three lanes for all of our kids. So we could have lanes for all of our kids and then rent out those lanes in the afternoon for other Southside high schools. Um, furthermore, we've only had one diver in the history of Southwest High School, mm -hmm. um, Journey Riggs. And when you when we add diving to it with the other components that go with it, you're talking about, uh, as we talked about when we started programming, the two words that we brought up were access and opportunity. We would really bring a lot more um, opportunity to our kids in the areas of diving in the area and swimming when it comes to that. Um, so those are a lot of those things. To answer your question, though, with the they swim a full district meet at New Canyon, a 25 stretch. Yeah. It, it can be done. Um, 
and and they take care of it. They don't have the the public part of it that we would have to that. But the revenue side too, uh, because part of this is we would get the lease out part of the, the building and, and, and share and reduce the cost uh, mm -hmm. during the opportunity. We would not be able to with just a 25 meter beyond the high school, correct? Uh, correct. We, would we would not be able to to be able to, to lease it out for a competitive community college swimming or college swimming. You you can the high the, the colleges do some of those things, um, but if we were going to do like a, a summer a big summer meet where they're swimming long course, we wouldn't be able to host a a big a big time meet. Um, you wouldn't be able to get the number of swimmers in to be able to warm up. And you wouldn't be able to get the number of the length that some of those that you would need to, to do some. And the big time meet means more team, right? right. Because meet it might be instead of a, a regional, it might be a sectional, which is bigger. And so, if you have a longer pool, so one one of the competitive advantages is now you have both courses you can run simultaneously. Mm -hmm. The other advantage for you for the longer pool is that. This dimension is 25 yards across the pool every day, and, and this is where you use the pool most of the time. Every day, the kids from the schools are going to come practice here. Mm -hmm. And the more lanes you have, the more kids who can get in the water in an efficient amount of time mm -hmm. to get them in the water and get them back to the class. And so the more lanes that you have, it's more efficient for the student athletes today. Right. And, and, the, and the 25 stretch will serve your needs today. To grow in any capacity that the program takes off. Like That's Nutane, the like Nutane, you heard, you heard that they're putting high school practice facilities in there at probably five and a half million a pop. Mm -hmm. So, but I think that's what we need to know, though, because right. I mean, we're we're deciding between a twenty-five and a fifty, but really, the twenty-five is not even something that I mean, if we didn't have. So let me. So we kind of need to start from the beginning. But this the decision was made to so for us to be within the current budget and have a second pool like where we would use for instructional and for the students and with shallower water 25 yard stretch is on the table because we want to make sure we can get right. within the budget if we're still okay with staying with two pools the 50 meter stretch is going to take us out of the budget the athletic program and the all the swim coaches and pretty much everyone we've talked to say we need a, we, a 50 meter would be our best for future growth and get more kids in the pool uh, and so there's that's the kind of the, the question here is that's what I recommend the 50 meter based on the fact that my kids swim since they were in second grade all the way through high school um, just because there's so many things going on in a meet not only is there warm-ups there's cool downs right after the, com the competition, there's uh, people coming in and out for concessions, just all kinds of things happening. So of the, to me, the 25 meter pool, which we swam in different places, they're very small, but they're very congested. You know, you have the seating, people bring chairs and there's no room to even walk around in or anything. It gets really bad. So the larger area that we have, the better we for our students and the more students that we can serve. Dr. Horst said when we started this out, it was uh, the, uh, I guess it was the city, not the county, but the city that uh, we kind of partnered up with. They had a part. We still have that, right? Correct. Correct. But don't we have an obligation, since we're taking city money, to be able to make it so that you can have outsiders use that? So there's our obligation is to turn it into a community uh, center in the summertime month for the non school year uh, oh, so that they have access to, no. to that facility. Oh, did, did we no, get no. you were going to have a meeting with the city rep representative uh, to see if we could maybe access more funds? Did you was that how did that go? Yeah, I think they, they heard it. Uh, Brandon, Rafael, and I went and we had the meeting. Doesn't look like there was anything concrete on paper that was going to bring us any revenue sources during the time frame that we have because we're dealing with bond funds and, and we have uh, time information problems. Sure. Uh, there's potential. We, we also found some new information that what was going to happen on the adjacent property next to us is not going to happen uh, uh, as we once thought it was going to. So uh, I would say that. 
that venue is still there, but it's more of a long term. It's a long shot. Picture. So we cannot, in making our decision, we can't count on any additional revenue from that. <coughs> right. right. But, you know, talking to Brandon, what I understand, that site blocks the infrastructure, which is going to take some of the dollars away from the project so that we can have parking and drainage mm -hmm. and, you know, electricity and water. I guess it would be water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that's where uh, we're seeing a good chunk of the funds going, mm -hmm. the infrastructure that we're going to the building. Um, and so, yeah, if we want it in budget, it would have to be a 25 meter. Uh, does that serve us uh, into the future? I don't believe it does, because <coughs> most of our high schools are probably our first high school will yeah. be 6A mm -hmm. uh, in the next uh, couple of years. So it's not going to take long to get out there. But when you need the, you know, the 50 meter to be able to serve outside mm -hmm. people? Cool. My understanding of a conversation with our uh, athletic director in some cases, it definitely would. We would not be able to host the summer events, uh, but if you had a 50 meter, you'd be able to host okay. all the events and even larger and more. Uh, well, cool. it, well, what it does is, is if you want to have multiple schools rent your facilities, the more lanes you have, the, if you they want to use it, like clubs want to use it. I mean, because that's where you get a lot of your fees will be in rentals and yeah. renting it out to others, uh, and that's to help cover costs of the running the facility, because right. the facility is going to be quite expensive to run with all the chemicals and the personnel, yeah. but you're able to uh, kind of supplant that with renting it out and, and getting people to use your facility. Do we have to repay Palo Alto? <coughs> I don't know if that's a How much do we pay Palo Alto right now to use their facility? It's uh, I think it's $25 a lane. For the time we, day we use it. Every day? time we use lanes. Oh, yeah. And I'll be honest, we, we don't just, our, soft, our our swimming team is not the only teams that utilize our culture, utilize Palo Alto for mm -hmm. training anymore. We've had our basketball and softball teams and baseball teams to go and utilize it for different for different reasons as well, as, as better, like, for different kind of training. Therapy and strength training. So, so have we figured out? training hideout, there's, let's say there's Southwest and we have two lanes to practice. Then there's the Central, South San, I don't know who else goes, but at one point there was like four, we'll I mean, there's a lot of, sometimes. so we only have two lanes to practice, and well, it's, 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 there's a lot of things yeah. happening whenever you but ran out the pool. I do want to say, though, that as as we went to New Canyon, I agree with Dr. Burst, that I think the 50, I would recommend the 50 stretch if we could, too. We could get what we need to get done to fulfill our duties and to be able to do it in a 25 meter stretch. I just, I would, as I think everybody's come around to a little bit, is I think you're going to get more done and be better off in the future if you, as as Will also said, if you have a 50. I'm concerned about having a 25 foot stretch because I don't know if it's like warming up in those shallow pools. No, and they, they and need those deep deeper, deeper for warm ups and cool downs. Well, and you're not going to have as much seating. I mean, if we host the district, we'll, we'll be able to host the district swim meet. And we won't be able to host a, a regional meet. If we have a 50 meter pool, we could possibly, possibly host a portion or a part of the a regional meet um, at some point in time. Uh, if you, but you won't have the seating capacity to host a very big meet in a 25 meter stretch. You're talking, I think we're talking in the 500 range at tops in a, in a 25 meter stretch. And not only that, but Palo Alto may even want to venture out and rent for the airport in a large event for their facility. This was close enough that would help support them as well, or vice versa. Well, I know the Junior Olympics was the case of Palo Alto might have participated in that in the opening ceremonies. And it was, that was huge. I mean, the, the amount of people that were there was unbelievable. Yeah. And and just practice wise, logistically, you're talking you'd probably move a swimming athletic period to the first period and then you you would be able to swim and dive at the same time. Finish. And you can develop a swim through your diving program with your swim program and then in the spring after the season they start doing water polo. And the other thing that we kinda of laughed at when we came was they had moved their bulkhead a little bit over. So that they could train long force because you want your that's where they start working on their their summer conditioning and things like that and they moved it and it, their long course training was literally about one extra stroke 
oh. um, to go. <laughs> and so when you train in a 50 meter pool, you know, it's a, it's a whole lot different uh, swimming yeah. um, doing that. And then finally, the two pool thing, I'm not, I would, I was very, um, I was, I was very uh, adamant about that to a certain degree, just because if you go to, when we go to swim American classes, and those little second graders get out and the teeth are shivering mm -hmm. and talk to some of the second grade teachers and things like that, that's the only thing that they're like, it's really cold. <laughs> and so um, if you want to really build those programs, you want those kids to want to get in that water. And um, as they learn to swim, then they want to, they're not so worried about the cold, they're worried about how fast they can go. Mm -hmm. Kids get used to the cold. My kids swim in December when the pool isn't even warmed up or anything. They have to jump in there and get used to it. So the second pool is just for small America? No, no, the second pool would be a warm-up pool. Oh, okay. It would be instructional. instructional. We could use it for And when you say warm-up pool, is that something that the athletes need before they get in the cold pool, or what mm -hmm. is that? Correct. Is that like a necessity? They have warm-up and cool-down. It's a necessity. Yeah. So, so some of the difference between having a second pool and not is now you have to have, spec for, from the community side and yeah. instructional side, now you have to shallow mm -hmm. up your competitive pool. Mm -hmm. And that's not bizarre. Not in a competitive no. We've been to a lot of meets in Palo Alto where they, there's huge meets, where there's people coming from all over the region, where they're holding simultaneous competitive on both pools. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just, they just have two lanes for warm up and cool down, and there's all of them going on twice. I mean, it's crazy. I, I guess my fear is I don't want to value engineers stuff mm -hmm. out yeah. that we really need. And that's why I think if we know, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm afraid to look at the last piece, but mm -hmm. if whatever mm -hmm. it is, then if it's like six million dollars mm -hmm. to say, then we have to know that, yeah, and correct. then this, correct. and then so this is these are if you see, yeah, and so we okay. can make it better. And that's, that's part of today's exercise, because okay. to be truthful, this is one decision, but there's probably three other big decisions in this project that right. I think you understood. Okay. Our, well, like I said in the first project, our goal was to try to make sure that we could get within the bond budget right. uh, and then yes. and then determine from there where do we go right. uh, meeting with you all. Uh, right. We know that okay. Southwest High School, to say this, this is our third renovation on that school. Thank you. Uh, we put money in there. I don't know when the next time we're going to do an editorial. Uh, mm -hmm. And this may be a priority from the board with fund balance to this project. Mm -hmm. And But I wanted to make sure that you guys get all the information Right. Uh, and and look at what our decisions are going to be with recommendations. We're not because believe us, we we haven't been one before. So we're talking to Coach Wagner and his group, going to other districts, seeing what other districts have. We were kind of like, let's get a 25 yard stretch school, but then we couldn't find one to go see, and we found one school in the whole state of Texas that has it. So I don't know if that's the model yeah. we want to follow, right? Uh, because we don't want to be. 15 years from now saying, man, we got three high schools and we, right. we only can get one high school in that pool at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't use anybody, let anybody else use it because right. we're... Mm -hmm. So those are decisions, but we also have decisions on construction of the pool. We have decisions on uh, humidification, seating. So because we can kind of go through everything so you can see it and then at the end, show you where we're at because okay. we're still early on. Um, are uh, you yet giving us options as far as uh, if we build the pools but hold off on certain other things around, things we, have, we can expand on. We, we want to show you where we're at now, and then let us go back and say what we cannot possibly, because we don't want to eliminate anything right now. Right. Because yeah. we know we, the direction you all is don't value engineering until we see the whole thing and right. we can make decisions. Yeah. So we want to show you the whole picture, and then you say, well, look, we don't need two pools. Well, then that pool, that's a huge savings. But uh, then we deal with our situation with having to add shallow kids dealing with the cold water. So we, let's go through the whole thing. You can kind of see the yeah. whole picture. Okay. I want to say something about the term value engineering. It's really something that should be done when the architects do it. Well, what we don't want to do is not have enough money to have to cut stuff at the end. Correct. And uh, uh, that hurts everybody. Right. So. Yes, sir. The only thing about, I'm all, the only thing I'm saying about value engineering is I want to know what we're giving up, like, and how much money that is. You know, yes. like. No, I agree with you. Yes. So, but we need to tell you how much it's going to cost first yes. overall right. before right. we say 
this is what we can take out to get to this number where y'all right. wants to be. Yeah. Okay. So we still have two more decisions discussed today. No, this is the only thing we got left today. Okay. So this whole rest of the day is the this. So I can help you get getting comfortable with everything that's being discussed with the next couple of slides. What I've done is I've advanced past the site concepts. Now it comes in the slide that talks about pool construction. And as Mr. Christmas has mentioned, there is some other considerations with this. Now I'm going to back up a little. In budget, we've, we've, we've put the project in budget. It's a 25 meter pool stretch with dive and a second pool for therapy and instruction. Correct. And 500 seat spectator seating and natural ventilation mm -hmm. and heating. Not a enclosed dehumidification system. And I'll talk to all of these here in a minute. But the first item I want to talk about that talks about budget and where we are, there are two different types of pools right now. There is the traditional concrete pool construction. That's what's in the budget right now for the for the uh, for the uh, stretch 25 and the second pool. Then there's another construction type. And it's called a pre-engineered uh, panel system, pre-engineered system. Murtha is one of the larger recognized manufacturers, and actually uh, almost all international uh, meets and, and uh, um, uh, Olymp uh, Olympic, thank you, Olympic events are Murtha pools. And quite often, they are one-time use, broken down, and sold to somebody, school districts, college, uh, universities, private, that buy up these pools and, and reinstall them. Uh, those are typically your, your 50 meter pools. Now, <clears throat> what, is a, what is a traditional? It's, it's formed up like this building probably was the foundation. It's a formwork cast in place and shot creek. Shot creek where they come in and, and gunite. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with that, but you, you, you basically blow the concrete on there, tool it. You have to line the pool, or I shouldn't say line the pool, but you need to finish it with either a plaster or some tile. Um, the Murtha is a stainless steel pre-manufactured system. We basically, we provide them, a, the contractor apply, provide them a slab, mm -hmm. and they build on top of that. Mm -hmm. And it's a lined system. Um, the benefits behind, behind that, and I'll show you here in a second, is on the traditional, requires uh, former rebar, shot creek, pneumatically applied. The waterproofing, the waterproofing on a concrete, anybody that's familiar with one, it's susceptible to crack. We are on expansive soils, it'll have to be a suspended uh, uh, facility. That's just gonna drive the cost up. The Murtha will have to be on that as well, but you only get a one year warranty with the pool. Concrete, it's higher maintenance because whether you have plaster, or you have tile, the chemistry, the, the water chemistry, actually attacks the grout. Mm -hmm. And you wind up having to replace the grout and the tile if the water chemistry is not digit, uh, uh, just maintained to the pristine levels. Versus Murtha style or pre-engineered, it's a stainless steel system, it's a, it's a factory applied vinyl uh, PVC membrane, uh, chemically welded uh, at seams. The system uh, uh, is it, it can take a little bit more movement than a concrete foundation can. But the biggest thing is chemistry, or the second biggest thing is chemistry. PVC that you can you can mess up on the chemistry, and you're not going to attack the system. You're not going to be replacing grout in the long run. <clears throat> the interior finished low maintenance. The other is between 15 and 20 year warranty. They're gonna they're gonna provide you a 15 minimum 15 year warranty on water leak. That's huge. That is huge. And then uh, it is a little more costly. Typically, we see 15 to 25 percent. We're actually been in contact with Martha. They've given us a little bit of costing, and, and it's kind of reflected some of the latest numbers I put in there. But we are right now currently back up another step. We're in the process of getting the CMR on 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 on, uh, on the project, as, uh, such as the other project. And as soon as they get in, we're going to start to verify these numbers. We have some pretty good historical data that we run on. We 
feel pretty comfortable, but we need them to verify. So that's the difference between. So that's that's question number one. Is it a marker or is it concrete? Of course, it's going to cost a little bit more for the marker, but you get a much better warranty. Uh, it's a little more forgiving on your water chemistry. Um, here is a couple of facility examples of a 25 meter and then a 50 meter pool. Here's a 50. This is the latest pool that we've done. Just opened up. Uh, it's gone through the latest uh, uh, cold weather uh, uh, system that came through. Uh, this is a naturally ventilated facility. It is not a dehumidification. Dehumidification is basically, it's not an air conditioning system. It's one thing I want to make sure everybody understands. It is not air conditioning. You are still going to feel 82 degree weather in there. And I call it weather. It, de it removes a lot of the humidity. That's what it's doing. So let's talk a little bit about these questions about cost and budget. Our budget is $17.5 million for construction costs. We have a total project budget of $21 million. That includes the, the $3.88 million, or $3,880,000 from the city. That's a part of that $21 million. Based on what we've seen, uh, historical data, cost for a facility like this is anywhere between the range of $385 a square foot to $410 or $15 ballpark. The, what the $385 gets you, gets you basically what we're looking at. It's 25 meter stretch, but it's a concrete pool, not a Martha. It is a 500 seat facility, not 750. It is, dehumid it is naturally ven uh, ventilated, not dehumidification. And again, it's the 25 meter. That's what gets us in the budget. The 410 starts to talk about dehumidification, starts to talk about MRTA. Uh, it doesn't change the size, but that's what the 410 will get you. So some of the major cost items are pools, uh, the pool tank itself, the seating, the amount of seating. Um, uh, the building shell, what is it comprised of? Is it tilt wall, is it pre-engineered? Is it uh, a steel frame with uh, CMU infill? Those are some of the aspects that we'll be answering with the CMR to get a better <coughs> what we feel is appropriate for this region, the architecture, the cost, the budget. Uh, then site work. It was mentioned earlier, site work is going to be a, a, a fair amount of the, the cost, but that's going to happen no matter what. So we don't really have as much to influence there unless we put you on gravel parking. So here we are. We have a total project budget of uh, 21 million. You take the 17,120 for the, the bond funding and then the city funding of 388. Our total construction budget, 17,5. What are we at in the budget? We have 20, and again, I'm reiterating some of these things. 25 meter stretch pool in lieu of the 50 meter. This is so that we're in budget, just getting us in budget. Traditional concrete pool construction in lieu of the pre-engineered, the 500 spectator seating in lieu of 750. Again, if you have if you have a lot of teams coming, you're going to get crowded with 500. You can still run it in the 25 meter stretch, but if you get several teams here, you're going to be crowded. Uh, natural ventilation in lieu of uh, dehumidification. You still have heating on either side and then all other and when I say all other aspects in the desired program we're talking about all the other uh, items that were in the program that was that was de deemed necessary or required as a part of the functioning or uh, uh, desired for bringing athletics over all of that is still in here that's the good part so you get a 25 stretch concrete uh, natural ventilation 500 seats so where, what are some of the costs if we want to, this is, where I'm, this is where I think will help you. What does it cost to upgrade? Or what are some of the program alternatives? All right, well, what if we stick with the 25 meter stretch and just change from conventional concrete to, to MRTA? That's gonna be about a half million dollar ad. <coughs> what if we go from a 25 meter stretch to a 50 meter, but it's still concrete? That's a $1.9 million ad. Or roughly two, uh, and when I show these two different numbers here, one is construction cost, 
the additional construction cost? And when is, what does it add to the overall project budget? Okay, okay so it's, it's tracking those two different numbers, our construction and our project. Right. Then what if we upgrade not only from a 25 to a 50, but make it a, a MRFA? Well, it's, a, it's about 2.2 million. And again, this is on some latest numbers I've received. Um, I'm, I'm real skeptical about overpricing it or underpricing it. And then there's spectator seating from 500 to 750, which is about, it's about a million dollars square foot. If you look at the square foot, it's about a million dollars. So this is going to explain that. If we go to a 50 meter, it's almost, you would probably need to upgrade your seating. That would be a recommendation. Yes, yes. Now let me let me back up. When, when it's not just the seating here that's influenced. Now with five, going from 500 to 750, we now need three ways out of there. Mm -hmm. So now that's an additional stair. Mm -hmm. Your bathroom, your 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 uh, occupant load is is a third larger. Right. So now I've got to add a little bit more square footage for bathrooms. So that's it, okay. it's not directly. There's some indirect cost in there. Uh, from having an up, upside. But at the end of the day, that's where we're we'll Natural ventilation versus dehumidification. You see the image right here. This is actually the Walker project that we just completed. And it actually, it, it, it's uh, several facilities do this. And what we do is we take advantage of natural convection. And here we, we have the slope in the structure, our seating on the high side of the structure, our teams can of the uh, on both sides of the pool. But we open up the pool, bring in the natural air. South Texas, 90% of the time we have good weather. Yeah. It's either blistering hot, you're not going to condition the space, so you're going to deal with the blistering hot. Right. But now you have the ability to allow natural convection through a louvered system or, a, or any other porous system that can be sealed up, it allows the air to transfer through. So even on stagnant days, just by the heat rising, it's going to try to pull some air through there. But we also take advantage of some ceiling fans over the mm -hmm. spectators. You try not to put that over where the, where the swimmers are because they don't like drafts. Right. Um, so that's one advantage of a natural ventilation. Okay. And then it's it's you heated. Do that um, graph there. Is there seating for the student area as well? And, and so what we have is, yeah, they have the ability to do it right here. This is a wider deck area here. And then we have appropriate deck width here. And then they actually even have on this side of this wall right here, another 10 foot wide concrete pad that they put tip and rolls on for the teams. Okay. And the teams, we work that quite nicely. Teams now have, there's 11 garage doors, excuse me, across that side. And it's garage doors that come up and they can team at each bleacher set. But to answer your okay. question, we would add bleachers. That's oh. one of the things that... Yeah, because uh, yes. Kenny, Kenny I know that the swim teams, on. they don't like sitting around on the floor. No, and you're right. We have all their stuff in the wet and what yeah. have you. In our program, have bleachers in for the, for, the, for the students. And, and I know you're talking about the doors and the air, but typically pools don't really open all that space. It's there, but they don't really... Well, and in, in, in this, in this uh, facility, they actually open it all up. They open it up and let it run through. And uh, when this cold snap came through, we closed it, mm -hmm. opened up certain vents to remove the chloramine, mm -hmm. and used the uh, forced air heating system. For you guys, you have some good gas. That you have gas here, we'd probably use radiant heat. That's one of the options, but we can still use the forced air. The other thing nice about this, in the future, this is one of those items you can buy in the future. If you want to do dehumidification in the future, you can still do natural ventilation, still do the forced air heating, take advantage of the existing ductwork, and change out the unit for a dehumidification system later. Okay. That's how we phased it and did it for Northeast School of Walker. Okay. That's how that's designed. The shell of the building is actually would be compliant mm -hmm. down the road should uh, uh, they close it up and do dehumidification. Compliant in the sense that it has all the thermal values that it is, is required, okay? And then the other is, this is uh, the, actually the facility right next door. This is under dehumidification. Closed in, uh, not a lot of natural light, um, and 
have you have it's it's a it's a uh, gabled and or hipped roof, and so they would have to if they left it uh, naturally ventilated. They have to have these mechanical systems to pull the air out. So this is enclosed. So this is a dehumidified system. You still feel 82 degree air. It's just a little more comfortable, tolerable. Okay. So then here's the summary of those alternates. You can go from a, a, a pre uh, from a uh, concrete to a pre-engineered. You can go from a 25 meter to a 50 meter, but it's concrete. You can go from 25 to a 50 with an pre-engineered. Or you can go to, and you can upgrade the spectator seating to 750, and you can do dehumidification. Large number. That's why we really would recommend at this point, if budget flexibility is required, that may be an option not to take it this time. So what does that mean? Here we are in the original project in budget, 25,000. But then we start to add the desired, and I'm going to step off the cliff here and say the desired is a pre-engineered metal or pre-engineered uh, Martha pool, 50 meter. I have the construction cost here and the overall project cost there. Go to 750 uh, spectator seating, and then dehumidification. That puts the project, uh, the construction cost at 21,775, 7.6. 4.24 over the original construction budget. 4.77 million over the total project budget. So that top box is 25 meter stretch pool. But that's the price for a tool pool system, right? It is. Right. And, and let me back up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. These are always, we're always still considering two pool. I will back up a little bit further. If we got rid of a pool and still went to a 50, you're still over budget. That just having a 50 and concrete is still over budget. Mm -hmm. I buy a whole lot, but it's over budget. What is the outside of the building look like? Not quite there yet. Oh, we're not there. Yet. <laughs> not quite there. We don't. We have to answer these questions. The yeah, but the outside of the building is a good thing, right? We'll put in that bird screen. Yeah. But, oh. I mean, they have those pools that are just open, right? That the the outdoor out there, pools? Yeah. You know, similar to, to like Northside yes, at, one, at yeah. Ferris. Yeah. And they have an indoor pool as well. Oh, they yeah, they have the outdoor. Um, I mean, I don't know anything. And, and they're heated. I would uh, have a conversation with them. I know my conversations. They haven't been real happy with that okay. method, uh, so I think we should have that conversation and we're going to look at it. Okay. Yeah, I think part of some of the bigger problem is, is direct sunlight, contact mm -hmm. sunlight, you're not shaded. Uh, outside temperature, it's very, it, it varies to that. Yeah. You do have some kind of comfort inside a covered facility mm -hmm. as opposed to direct sunlight. And everybody knows we're trying to avoid that with the kiddos at this right. point. Yeah. So here are your <coughs> questions. 25 meter or 50 meter? Concrete pool or pre-engineered? Natural ventilation or dehumidification? Spectator seating size. Those are the major questions. So the better quality, longer lasting uh, is the pre-engineered? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. With a longer warranty. The larger question is, when you look at all of the projects we're talking about, what is the, all, the total cost yeah. of all that? Yeah. It's not just saying yeah. that a question of, is this a priority better than that in terms of the pool, is which projects I look at. So this is going to require a lot of thought and a lot of research. This is just really fantastic information. Thank you. I'm really pleased with the options, taking this out, adding that, and you know, really good information. So you have some good leadership. So I really want to go back to my question about the actual building around the pools. Is that the additional cost beyond what we're seeing? The buildings around the pool. Like the, the actual building. 
And that talk, he, because we, we don't have a picture of that oh. or anything. Okay. Is that included in this pricing? Yes. 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 Okay. It, it is a turnkey facility. Right. Yeah, okay. Turnkey, site, everything. Well, we have have we have 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 <laughs> well, I mean, but yeah. we're, we're looking at the project as using materials that are consistent with other projects that we've done right. and that you would see around the state. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And those are going to average out. Right. Okay. Right. That seventeen million five construction budget gets you a twenty-five yard stretch. This is all preliminary yeah, based on architectural. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure we understand this too. These guys are doing the best they can with pricing. When we get our CMR on, it's their job to help us really get it. Pin it down. Uh, that's confirm. their job, confirm. right? To confirm, confirm the pricing, right. to get us where we are. That The 17.5 gets us a 25 uh, meter stretch with a second pool, with athletic offices, with everything else that you saw in the program. Locker rooms, mm -hmm. site work. Drainage, all that. Parking lot. And if we went with the pool, with the larger pool, how many parking spaces do we have? And do we have a plan for overspending the event with holes? Well, that's yes, because that's why you kind of see us strategically determining where we put it next to McCullough. So that, because we actually have McCullough's parking lot. <laughs> and then, if we had to go to transportation, we have. No, I know, but we don't have yeah. plan to have Correct. people moving back and forth and what have you. We have to include that. Yes, ma'am. That's part of the, as we develop the site work and looking at the best options there. Yes, sir, I think we continue to look for funding. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got to pitch the idea of, you know, if you want junior Olympics to come, you know, you need to have a medical school facility that we can put to use, arrange your health, put a city family. And then we found a machine out there, you know, for a I know. Maybe we can get a Toyota. I'll try. I promise that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of your best marketing Where's Jan? Jan, is that your job? Yeah. Here's a piece of this. So I also want to explain a piece of this, is, which is outside of their scope, is that the, the agreement with the city is that uh, once construction starts, they're going to reimburse us. So part of their four million is really in our out of our pocket already, and then they will reimburse us. I just want to get that out front so you know that. Once we start building, once we start building right. well, because what we'll do is, you know, we have our architecture on board. We're going to set up contracts, requisitions, get a PO for them, and then once we get the CMR on and get a GMP, we'll have the whole project that we will fund, but will we get reimbursed? So it's going to look at one point that that four million. It looks like we're spending it, but we are, but we're getting reimbursed. So just so you know that there's four million is gonna be tied up in this, that's fund balance from us, but we're getting reimbursed really. on it. Right. We've done that with a lot of other Correct. projects or things. Correct. So if we if we want everything like the, the biggest thing and the, everything, <laughs> we're looking at about four point eight million dollars mm -hmm. over budget. At this point right now, without having a CMR right. pricing this for us. Yes. Okay. And then from there Let's say we go without. Let's say we visit like the Walker Pool. It's kind of hard now because it's colder, but they don't have the dehumidification. Oh yeah, yeah. we could cut that out. Maybe. Yes. What about and all these things that we buy for inside? Does that include all of the things that they use for Swim America and all this stuff? The, in the, in it's included right here in, in the total project budget. Correct. Yeah. So that four point eight million that was identified as the, as the additional that we. So I, sure. I think what we would do is look for where is the board willing to go about and then we'll make some proposals. Like we probably would say with the 500 seating, uh, would not do the humidifier, uh, set up as a future opportunity. But stay with the swim opportunities mm -hmm. for our youth, yes. uh, swim opportunities for our community, yes. and uh, competitive uh, swimming for our high schools, but also opportunity to generate revenue mm -hmm. by leasing that facility out uh, so we can play for the flooring. So if we yeah, cut out if we cut out the dehumidification system, we could potentially add that on within a year or two. 
We, as soon as we get the extra million dollars, we, we're going to be set up for it. Yes, true. It'll cost us more. In the budget, we yeah. should consider it, though. I feel. Well, so I'm going to. I'm going to. I want to talk about like our experience with like say legacy, where we mm -hmm. added, we went back and put parking lots and mm -hmm. stands, and it ended up costing us more in the end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. So. Yeah, I, I, if we're gonna, if, if, if we think this is gonna be something this, we're gonna do in the next three or four years, we, why didn't we know? We yeah, if not, if we think we can last longer than yeah. I would say, the bullet. We need to do more research and get with other school districts that have these, and they haven't put a dehumidification in for 10, 15 years. Or bring us a budget, it. see what it looks like to us, us our budget. Yes. You know where we could take it out of, how long it would take, or what have you. I will say our fund balance is strong. The the thing that we'll have to do, and I mentioned it the last project, is prioritize because mm -hmm. I know the other one's like three something, three million, three mm -hmm. point something, and this one's four point seven. Mm -hmm. And then we have other projects. So it's really it's a discipline. No, we don't want to do that either. Well, we we don't want to take from projects that take from the classrooms. Correct. That's a definite. Correct. Do we have our final well, I mean, our final well, funding numbers from last year? Yes, I'll be bringing those at the board. So we, yeah. If it's just a, when you say taking away from the classroom, if it's just a matter of making it more aesthetically pleasing, then I'd be up mm -hmm. to discussing that. That can wait. Okay. okay. We have That's why we will visit and see if you can see what we're, we're mm -hmm. seeing so that you say, yeah, this is, looks good enough. Yeah. Well, I mean, because yeah. then you have to, ultimately, we answer to the community. Correct. And if, I mean, we have to be, feel good within ourselves to be able to say, well, we didn't do that because we wanted you to have this, or, you know, we did this, no. Oh. We'll get to that later, right? Yeah. But I also want to make sure we always remember, too, that this facility on the south side is going to change the skyline mm -hmm. of the south side of San Antonio. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's going to generate other districts to kind of follow suit in the future. So mm -hmm. it's an investment in who we are. Uh, it's an investment right. to kids that aren't even in our schools yet. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's definitely going to encourage uh, families to want to choose to go mm -hmm. Southwest. There's a lot of benefits that come from uh, the facility. Uh, and it's going to be uh, hard, I think, to make some decisions, but I think we can get to, to the completion of this project, and I'll be happy with it. And knowing that we still have other projects that are going to go over. I think when Brandon presents some numbers, I, I think... <coughs> Uh, we're going to be able to see that there may be some light uh, with uh, some unexpected uh, change in revenue going That's forward. Right. That's you from you have some money. Yeah. Yeah. Things that so he, he planted a no, dollar tree in the backyard. <laughs> 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 oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Richard already said it's a pitch in. As far as the city agreement with the pool, do, are we, uh, do we, say the charter schools in our area want to uh, pay to use the pool, are we going to say, oh yeah, sure, but then that's going to be a selling point for them to... Well, maybe if we get their kids in, they come back to sell better than their other No, that pool is under the operation of Southwest ISD. Okay. Yeah. That's completely turned over to us. All right. Yeah, so there's just a city agreement that we were going to our community. They don't want any part of operational okay. or telling us what to do. They just want to be a part of the this phase and mm -hmm. see it. And then yeah. as long as we're holding our part, I don't think they're out. <laughs> yeah, they'll we do anyway. I mean, we're, we're about to do. Yeah. Well, and if those students, uh, you know, there's a lot of charter schools in our, like, for example, in the area that's going to be built. If they visit the pool, they might decide to come to our school. No, no, I'm not back. saying they can't visit the school. What I'm saying is we don't want to be right. renting it out to IDEA and oh, yeah. KIPP and all these people, and then they can say, oh, we have access to a pool. I mean, is that greedy? I don't know. No. Can I be saying that out loud? I don't know. We can approach it when we get to it. When we yeah, it. We'll see. How are we going to get around that? Current the person that we want them to come. We, 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 would, we would basically mitigate that through our facility usage uh, mm -hmm. process. That we have. There's going to be. Okay. We're not going to put a big sign on there. No charges allowed. <laughs> we won't do that. Why not? Public public pool for public school. For real public school. I like it. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go, James. If this those students live in the community, the most cats are going to be in the community. We sound yeah. terrible. We're just no, no, no. Okay. This was a great presentation. Yeah. Yes. And we are so far ahead of where we were before we came in here. 
Good, thank you for Thank you so much for your work. That was really, really an eye-opener. Is there anybody else have any other questions? You are so prepared. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Southwest Legacy Theater for performs a lot. Thursday and Friday, the 7th and 8th. Uh, 7th and 8th. Um, yeah, yeah, like um, November 12th, on board retreat. It's going to be in the evening because we figured out the days don't work. Uh, this Wednesday, November 13th, is going to be Southwest High School College signing day for three of our athletes, or four of our athletes, I believe. Four of our athletes. Uh, which I understand is the first time we have three or four of them going to Division One, um, which is a yeah. special thing. Uh, Ten fifteen in the morning at Southwest. Yeah. And then at, uh, transportation Thanksgiving luncheon Thursday November fourteenth. Eleven thirty transportation. Sir, we got one more thing that we would like to share. Uh, Thomas is going to talk about our, okay. our water issue with Southwest. Okay. Uh, okay. We're going to take you back on the. Renovation piece, but we want to have fun with the board. So, <laughs> we'll be happy to be after Thomas. Yeah, these we'll things are <laughs> So, we uh, uh, through TCEQ requirements, we are required uh, to start this. We, we are required every three years to do water sampling, lead and copper sampling on the two water systems that we currently have. Uh, we just got back the testing that we did in the August uh, round was when we do it every August. Three of the sampling sites of the 20 that we do every year inside Southwest High School came back slightly elevated <coughs> on the lead side. The action level for copper is 1.3 milligrams per liter and lead is 0 0.015 milligrams per liter. We had two or three of them that came uh, slightly over the action level and I can That's not going to be able to be seen, but there's uh, one, one of them, and uh, so the, the action level for lead is 0 0.015, and we had three of them that came in over that. One of them was 0 0 0.07, 0 0.022, and 0 0.030, uh, so they're slightly elevated. We believe that it was due to, the, in these areas where we had some construction stuff that we went on, we think that because of that, maybe it stirred up a little bit that has come through. Uh, looking at the rest of the test reports, the, the action level is 0 0.015. Everything in all of the other 20 or 18 samples were 0 0.01 something. So they were, they're registering. They're just not registering over that 0 0.15, which these did. So currently we are on a uh, schedule to have to the one thing we'll have to do is we're going to have to issue lead public education out to anybody that's a, that uses this water system and we're it's specifically this one here at the main campus so we will have to do a mail out to the students at southwest high school and southwest elementary because i think they're going to make us use the whole system and then we will be able to email all the faculty and staff uh, email will work for tcq but we feel that for the parents to know from the kids we're going to do a mail out there with that, we are going to, the, the part that's required from TCQ we're sending, with it, we're going to have attached a letter that I'm going to work with Janice on to explain the situation and why we're going to try and not have it uh, get elevated. Uh, so uh, we will go through the process and tell them what we're doing, why we think it's happening, uh, let them know that we're working on it. That the only other deal is we have to, instead of it at a three-year interval, we have to do testing now on the sites that tested high. We did the water test yesterday, sent them off to the lab. We have to do them again in six months, and then again in six months after that mm -hmm. of the full 20, uh, 20 samples. So when we get to the end of that one year period, we will work with TCQ and see if there is a recommendation. If, if it comes back again where they're still slightly elevated, we will have to do some type of remediation maybe in those areas. The chances are that it's going to come back back under the, the levels and we won't have to do anything. I said most of the time the recommendation is to do nothing. So but we just have to go through this step process with TCQ for the next year and, and do that. We just didn't want y'all to catch window and get blindsided by this, so we wanted to let the board know 
what was going on as we go. The letter we are required before November 30th to send the letter out to the to the folks on the lead uh, education and what's going on. So we'll be doing that uh, prior to the Thanksgiving break uh, here in the next week or two. Tom, is by construction affecting it? You mean what, like the movement we, of we the soil? Some, well, we did some renovation work inside those restrooms. Well, can you explain where copper is kind of cool, or elevated lead? Yeah, the, the lead, the two sites, there were two sites, and one was in the girls' locker room shower, and one was in the women's restroom of the gym, uh, one of the sinks in the gym. And then the other one was in room six, which, and now that sink doesn't even exist anymore because we remote it out and we're having to do another testing site for that. So there was, and we had done work in those showers. If you all remember phase one, there was ADA work. And that was, has been since the three year test we did the last time. So we really feel like it, that's, that's what's causing it. When you turn the water off and on a lot, the scaling that's built up on the inside of the pipes will fall mm -hmm. off and break. Okay. And then it re-exposes some of that solder. So as the scaling comes back, we feel that it, it's not gonna be an issue. Oh, okay. So it removes itself, is that what you're saying? Well, the, the scaling, because the water, the, the line doesn't have water in it all the time. So like over the summer, there was no water that year that we did that. All the scaling probably fell off the pipe and then gets mm -hmm. washed down when it's dry. Pipe, so. Yeah. And so when they go dry, then they get brittle and crack and then it re-exposes it. So then it has to re rebuild its scaling. Right. There are no slightly elevated uh, marks of any of the drinking fountain areas. Oh, so okay. it all has to do with this the shower and how to do the sink. Shower and two sinks. And you're going to put that in the water. Yes, ma'am. And, and it is, I, I remember walking through when we were doing, I think, phase two or phase one, and they had it all exposed in that area. So yeah. probably the new pipe or the solder, um, but it's not like dangerous, but it definitely is uh, a requirement to notify our community. Had we only had one, we wouldn't have to do this. Mm -hmm. But because we had more than one. <coughs> so, so are we going to continue yeah. testing the drinking water? Just to yeah, we, sure? we do all the time. I mean, we, we, we're always testing the water for uh, that's coming out of the well. That's okay. another part of the deal. We have to test the entry, entry source. Mm -hmm. So we're doing all that. But that did not come back with anything in it. It's mm -hmm. got to be coming from the pipes. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you.